Hey everyone, this is Andrew and welcome back to my Intro to Synthesis course. In this video we're going to be talking about oscillators in a lot more depth. So first of all, you might notice that I'm hand holding my camera and behind me I have a Eurorack system. However, we're actually not going to be talking about the Eurorack in particular in this video. Instead, we're going to be talking about this thing, which this is a Juno 106. Now we're only going to start with the Juno 106 and then we're going to move over to other synthesizers, but I thought it would be a great way to show you about oscillators by introducing you to a classic, very simple synthesizer and show you how its oscillator section actually works. So first of all, I have a patch dialed in. I'll turn down that chorus actually. Um, and I'm just going to play a note and you'll hear how beefy this thing sounds. Sounds very nice. And very easily I can dial in a sound and just, you know, play some nice pad sounds. And this thing's from 1984, so it does have that vintage 80s sound. Um, but in particular, I'm just going to show you about the oscillators. So we'll dial in here this DCO, as it's called. DCO is a play on VCO, which VCO, as you know, means Voltage Controlled Oscillator. And basically that just means it's, it's an oscillator that produces a tone. And a DCO is a oscillator that is controlled digitally, so it's a digitally controlled oscillator. And all that means is that the timing of the oscillators is going to be a lot more precise because it's controlled digitally instead of an analog voltage. And that's all that means. Now this synthesizer in particular, sorry about the, the lighting, the synth's in a weird spot that I can't just set up a camera. Um, but you'll see here, that you have two different waves you can choose from. Right now I have it set on saw, or sorry, right now I have it set on a square wave, but I can also hit this button and change it over to a saw wave or a mix of the two. Let me turn off my release. If I bring that filter up, here's saw wave. If I switch back, here's square wave. I turn both on, get both. So that's how the oscillator section works. Now, if you have just your square wave on, you can change pulse width modulation. So, and that's changing the width of the pulse. If you zoom in to this picture here, that is above that blinding light, you can see it's kind of a square wave, but it has a dotted line pointing to the pulse switch modulation, indicating that you can change the width of the pulse. Now you can also add an LFO into the mix. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna allow you to change the pitch according to the LFO. If I make this faster, it's kind of like adding vibrato, but you can add some warble onto your sound that way. Now you can also add a sub into the mix. And a sub is just going to be a very low frequency sound. If I turn this down, got a thin, if I turn this up, you see I get a low sub octave below. And then in addition to that, you can control noise. And last, but definitely not least, you have the range. And this just sets kind of the octave tuning of everything. Right now I have it on eight feet, go to 16. And then go to four. And that's it for the Juno 106 in terms of the uh, oscillator section. I'll be sure to bring this synth back in future videos where we talk about things like filters and envelopes, but uh, that's it for the oscillators. All right, so now we're back inside Logic looking at something called Diva. And this is a virtual analog software instrument by the company Yuhi, I believe you pronounce their name. Um, and this, this synthesizer focuses on analog modeling. So if you notice here, I have the DCO oscillator loaded. And it looks just like the DCO from the 106, most likely because it was modeled after the DCO from the Juno 106. So I have set it, I have it set to eight feet, and I'll put on a saw wave, and I'll put on, or sorry, a square wave, and I'll put on some sub, and then I'll play a note, and you can decide for yourself how it sounds. Now 
now the filter and everything else isn't modeled after the 106. You could swap out different filters and everything. But I just wanted to show this as an example because this particular plugin has a scope in it. So we can actually observe the waveforms as they're playing. So I'm going to keep the filter open and I'm just going to have a square wave turning off the sawtooth and I'll just set that to the middle and there's nothing activated in the LFO. Now if I hit a note very low, you'll see down here that is a square wave. I'll go up an octave. That's also a square wave. So you might have noticed that it's a little jaggedy. This slope, there's like a slope here and a slope down here and it's a little, it's not really like a straight line. It's kind of, kind of curvy. So the reason for that is when you build an actual synthesizer, there's com physical components, at least in an analog synthesizer, there's physical components that are actually making those waves happen. So the way it works typically is there's you know, some kind of thing charging and then releasing. And that's why you get this kind of weird, you know, it, things don't work perfectly in the real world. And a lot of the times that's what makes analog synthesizers sound different, is all these little imperfections. And if I hold out a note for a bit, I'll hold out a higher one. You can see that not only is there a little bit of slant to these, but there's actually like a little rounding and there's kind of like a wobbliness that happens in the oscillator. And this is the exact same if I plug in any old analog synthesizer into the computer and look at it under a scope. Um, it's not just the case with Diva. Diva, you know, just happens to model a lot of those features inside of its algorithm. So another cool thing to notice when you play a note is that when you play an octave, right now I'm just getting one oscillation on screen. If I play an octave up, I'm getting two, octave up from that, four, and then eight, 16, and that's just how notes work. Uh, if you want to hear a note an octave up, you play it twice as frequent. If you want to play a note two octaves up, you play it four times as frequent. And then all the notes in between that you hear as whole tones and semitones and scales and stuff and chords, they're just fractions in between multiples of two. So cool little general music knowledge, I guess, for you if you didn't already know that. But anyways, um, I'll switch the oscillator here to something different so we can observe it on the scope. And I'll make this so that I have, I have just volume, just oscillator two on, and it's set to a saw wave. So I'll play a note. It's a saw wave. And you'll see it's got some curvature and it's got a little dimple at the end before it recharges and shoots up. Now if I shoot it over to a triangle wave, it's a little curvy, back to a saw wave going in the other direction. And you can morph between these. Now watch what happens when I play a, uh, an, octaves, an octave together. get a combination of two octaves and if you shift between them you get a stranger uh, kind of waveform. Now if you start to blend in two different waveforms and I just play a single note, now this movement left and right is what I believe is due to imperfections in the oscillators and they're kind of just shifting past each other. Let me shift this to a triangle wave does the same thing. So the waves, when you play two waves on top of each other, they kind of add up and they shift past each other because they're they're not necessarily adding in volume. They're kind of combining in signal, if you know what I mean. Now if I add noise into the picture here, it's adding high frequency ripples into the waveform. And that's why it sounds so you know, brittle, I guess. And if I put noise back in, start to filter that out, the ripples become smaller because you're filtering out the high frequency content. Now, just to demonstrate what happens with the noise even more, I'll turn it up. That's open noise. As I filter down, you get less and less fast ripples. Here there's a lot of high frequency or fast ripples, and here only the slow ripples are going through, and that's how a low-pass filter works. The point I'm trying to get across here 
by showing you this waveform is just so you kind of get an intuition of you know, how a wave looks versus how it sounds. So when someone says saw wave to you, you picture that, you know, you have this... Actually, I'll go back to the analog one. I'm trying to get the point across that when you have this very, you know, abrasive shape... Oh, I'm on. Of a saw wave with sharp dips. So I'm bringing the filter up. You have this very aggressive change happening very rapidly, and that causes a very abrasive sound. Same with the square wave, two very abrasive changes, which causes a very abrasive sound. When I go to the triangle wave, it's a little less extreme. There isn't any sharp drops. It was just kind of rounding. And that's why the sound is a lot smoother, because the wave is a lot smoother. And as you add more high-frequency ripples and little tiny you know, points of discontinuity, it makes the sound more and more abrasive, I guess. So that's the point I'm trying to get across by showing you the scope in this video. Now we're going to dive into some into Serum, which is a modern, very powerful, very industry standard wavetable oscillator. So I mentioned in my first video about about just general types of synthesis that a lot of the times wavetable synthesizers are subtractive synthesizers and Serum is the same. You start off with a wave, you put it through a filter, subtractive synthesis, basic stuff. So if I hit a note now, you notice I have a saw wave loaded. And as you expect, very abrasive sound. Now you can actually dig in through Serum. By the way, this isn't going to be a full Serum tutorial. We'll get into that in the future. Um, but if I go to the analog shapes, I can do basic Moog, at least what I believe it is, and you can shift through the waves. And what that means is, if I click this view, you'll see it's kind of like a surface plot. And I can take slices of that surface plot to get different waves. If I go back to this and I do basic shapes, this one's less smooth. It's just got a bunch of random shapes in here. So it's got a sine wave, a saw wave, a triangle wave, a square wave, another square, another square, and a uh, kind of slanted square, I guess. Go to basic, let's see, basic mini. This is probably a mini moog. It's got the basic shapes you can do with mini moog, which is like a small square, a long square, triangle-ish, and a saw-ish kind of shape. So that's all good. Now Juno, this is what we were looking at before, the Juno 106. You can do different types of saw and square waves. But now let's go into something crazy, a digital wave. Or maybe, let's do spectrum. So if I click this monster wave, it's a contour. And the slices look very, very abrasive. So the contour plot shows you as you sweep, this is morphing abrasive kind of nightmare thing. So if I hit a note, what do you expect? Probably a very abrasive sound. And you do. Now the cool thing about wavetable synths, just a basic summary, is since you're morphing through these waves, you can actually do that on a somewhat live basis. So I can get an LFO, and I can throw it on this sucker here, and I'll set this to a bar rate, sync to BPM, and yeah, I'll hit a note. And now, over time, the actual waveform that I'm using is changing. Whereas something like Diva in the Juno 106, you select a waveform and roll with it. A wavetable synth synthesizer allows you to morph the waveform itself over time in a very controlled manner. And you can keep digging through these various shapes like Duda Choir. And uh, I'll turn off this LFO here. And I'll go through, let's do another, ooh, yeah, ooh. And, you know, looking at the waves, you can tell it's a little jagged, but not too jagged. So it's a relatively smooth sound with a little bit of high frequency content. You can actually go in here and just, let's look for something like a sine wave. I'm sure there's something. Uh, I think actually we go to basic shapes and go to a sine wave here. Sine waves have no abrasiveness to them. That's why they sound so just pure. And then as you go to a saw, you get that sharp edges and that abrasive quality. Triangle is kind of like just like a sharp sine wave, so that's why it sounds kind of like a sine wave. A little bit more high frequency content. Square, very abrasive. Other square, abrasive. More abrasive. And then a wobbly square. 
But anyways, moral of the story, different waves cause different sounds. And, uh, you know, there's different ways to look at waves in, in instruments. So, yeah. Now, in a wavetable synthesizer, you don't have control over things like pulse width modulation, which is PWM. You might see that on a lot of synthesizers that have square waves. So what you can do in a wavetable synthesizer is actually make a wavetable of the different pulse width modulations. And this is modeled after Juno. So if I hit a note, get an LFO, throw it on there. I can actually simulate the oscillator of the Juno by um, getting a square wave sub, throwing it down two octaves. Maybe two octaves is too much. So anyways, um, I'm not going to put filters and stuff on that because that's the topic of a future video, just covering the oscillators. But anyways, I think that pretty much covers it for this video. Just to wrap up again what I, I think you've learned and make sure I'm getting my point across clear. I just wanted to show you different types of oscillators, how they change the sound, a couple different interfaces in terms of how oscillators are set up in synthesizers, and so just so you can kind of look at a synth and just kind of know what to expect. You know, you, you see the controls for an oscillator and you should just be able to know like, okay, this knob is going to do that, this wave is going to be more abrasive, and this one's going to be really smooth. So I hope that now you can kind of do that. And even when you're opening up something like a virtual analog synth, you're jumping on like a Arturia synth, you see a guitar center, or you're opening up something like Serum and you're trying to load waves, hopefully you can just look at it and you have some intuition behind what you can actually expect. So if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, consider subscribing for more, and don't forget to ring that bell if you want to stay notified when I upload the next video. In the next video, we're going to talk about different types of filters and how they affect the sound. Now, in addition to these main videos, I'm also going to be adding to the playlist topics such as introduction to Serum, introduction to Massive, or whatever other synthesizers I feel like doing. So make sure to subscribe if you want to stay notified when those come out as well. Aside from that, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.